One more book review this afternoon. This one is for KCRXRD and for Frenchie D, who both requested that I read this and uh, post what I thought about it. So I thought I would. Um, this book is, both of them asked me to do Julian Barnes' A History of the World in Ten and a Half Chapters, which I posted a while back. This is the other one they wanted me to do. It's called Bertram Cope's Year by Henry Blake Fuller, and it's put out by, you can see the triangle there, it's put out by um, Triangle Classics, which publishes um, historically great LGBT fiction. There are two kinds of forgotten writer, I think. One is vaguely remembered when perusing a bookshelf or in passing conversation. You know, Hamlin Garland, didn't he write about farmers or something? Or maybe William Dean Howells, didn't he used to be considered one of America's great writers? These names that you vaguely but definitely recognize. And this is a precarious and maybe perhaps the more painful kind of literary death being half remembered and half forgotten. And maybe more graceful is the obsolescence that you meet when you're now completely and utterly unknown. <laughs> uh, this includes people like George Washington Cable, the uh, great American Creole writer, or uh, Zitkala Sa. Or, alas, the subject of this review, Henry Blake Fuller and his novel Bertram Cope's Year. To be quite frank, uh, I don't think we need to mourn the cultural loss of every writer who ever set pen to paper, solely judging from my reading of this novel. The only novel, by the way, that I've ever read by Henry Blake Fuller. My Triangle Classics edition has a very, very generous introduction full of biographical and literary material written by the famous American critic Edmund Wilson, and uh, which was originally published in 1970 in The New Yorker, which calls him a very important American writer of the early 20th century. I think Edmund Wilson has been known to tend toward the effusive in his praise. The novel tells the story, it's a pretty simple story, of Bertram Cope, uh, fresh from undergraduate school, who's just received his degree, who's decided that pursuing a master's degree might further his career prospects. So he, uh, he moves off to graduate school, and he, he soon falls under the charms of the uh, Grand Dame of local literary society, who's named Medora Phillips and the three young ingenues that she sort of associates with. Uh, one of them is a composer and one of them is a, is a poet the, of the young girls. And uh, Medora is sort of independently wealthy. Um, her husband is dead, so she doesn't have to worry about him anymore. And she just throws these fabulous parties and invites faculty members and their spouses and and graduate students over, and she sort of fancies herself this, you know, intellectual, I guess. Somehow, magically, I guess by his ravishingly good looks or his innocent, naive newness to the pole place, um, all of these women are attracted to him. Medora the three young girls that are always hanging around her. Um, at, you know, they're always inviting him to these teas and to these evening soirees. There's even an older man named uh, Basil Randolph or Basil Randolph who frequents these get togethers looking for young men from the university to mentor. Uh, which is, uh, or and he's constantly frustrated by Bertram's passive aggressive rebuffs and rejections. Today we would call Basil Randolph a troll, but back then he was just a mentor. At home, however, Bertram uh, writes to his friend, wink wink, uh, Arthur Lemoyne, telling him how much he misses him and how much he wants to see him. 
And eventually Arthur discusses uh, moving to live with Bertram in order to see if he can get a role in the local musical productions at the university. The university puts on. Uh, locals are a little surprised when they realize that Arthur has actually been cast in the role of a woman in the musical, which forces him to uh, prance around the university um, in women's clothes. But they don't read too much into it, I guess. And the fact that he's always hanging around Bertram. I don't know. I guess people were just a lot more naive back then than they are now. Uh, the novel ends with Bertram graduating with his master's degree and going back home with Ar without Arthur, who made an overt pass at one of the other male members in the musical cast. So the kind of novel that this is and whether you would be interested in it. This is really a novel of manners um, with its sort of interesting uh, little twist like cross-dressing. But, I mean, it's particularly highly stylized because of the subject matter uh, that it demands this sort of cloak of ambiguity, right? Fuller never, ever mentions the word gay because the word gay back then probably wasn't even associated with homosexuality. If I'm wrong about that, please correct me. But he doesn't even mention the word homosexual either. Um, the entire book is completely devoid of any sexual behavior behind, uh, beyond maybe a, bit a little heterosexual flirtation here and there. The ambiguity seemed a little too much for even some of its more literary readership of the time. The American Library Association's publication called Book List described this novel when it came out as a story of superficial social university life in a suburb of Chicago with live enough people and a sense of humor hovering near the surface. And another publication called New Outlook said that the study of this weak but agreeable man, Bertram Cope, is subtle but far from exciting. And I guess the cluelessness of these reactions and their lack of ability to interpret what seem to us is very obvious social situations. I mean, when you move in with another man and one of them is cross-dressing in a play and what hitting on other men, I don't know, maybe you'd put two and two together. I, um, but even a century later, when what we sometimes you know, identify as gay fiction, we're, we're not used to that genre or subgenre as being particularly subtle. We're used to having, you know, the sex of it or the other very obvious parts of it not being so veiled. But this is, and it had to be because it was published, you know, 94 years ago. This novel struck me kind of like Radcliffe, Radcliffe Hall's Well of Lonely, Loneliness or Virgilio Pinera's Le Carne de René which is uh, translated in English often as Renee's Flesh, which were both really full of historical interest, but ultimately falling short of being that sort of timeless LGBT classic fiction that they're often vaunted to be. The manneristic writing, which is kind of contemporary with the latter novels of Henry James, um, Henry James also published his, his last novels within... 10 or 15 years of when this was published. Um, the writing uh, that is uh, Blake's writing or Fuller, Fuller's writing, excuse me, hasn't aged nearly as well. The criticism of small bourgeois minds in a small university town isn't really anything new and isn't handled particularly deftly. However, as a gay novel, I think it stands out as more than just a bizarre curio of literary history. It is probably the first gay novel published in the United States in the year 1919. You have to think about how long ago that was and when that was and what was acceptable in American culture to flaunt 
in 1919. This alone, I think, should at least earn it a second look, even if Bertram and his worldly sprezzatura don't brashly shove more contemporary expectations of the gay novel in our face. So, if any of that sounds interesting to you, maybe something to look into. Bertram Cope's Year by Henry Blake Fuller.